Hey, what's up? And thanks for joining us for the podcast today. This is officially podcast number four of eight, and we're looking uh-huh. at section number three today. And in part three, it's titled Boys Club Christianity. <laughs> and this is the, the question that's really um, what we're seeking to answer mm-hmm. is, is the Bible anti-women and does it promote misogyny? Spoiler alert, you guys. The answer is no. No, it does not. <laughs> Hopefully that's not a shock to you. Uh, so we kind of kick off chapter eight. This is chapters, what is it, eight, nine, and ten? Seven, eight, and nine. Seven, eight, and nine. Oh, I'm even on the wrong page. So yeah. seven yeah. starts... Picking up at 103. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the question that we're seeking to answer right there is, does it really speak down as anti-women and does it promote misogyny? Like Bobby said, the answer is no. <laughs> but the reasoning why someone might ask that, yes, which why? we get to, is if there are some scripture passages when you look at just one verse out of context. And kind of going back to what we said mm. about the previous podcast with the statistics about how much you read your Bible. Yeah. You don't ever read your Bible and then you pick it up and you're trying to make sense of something. I get how it can be confusing mm-hmm. and how it could appear to be one thing that it's not. Mm-hmm. So he gives you a couple of scriptures on 106 that people often will mm. cite when it comes to this. You know, fathers have the ability to sell their daughters as property mm. to men. Yeah, yeah. If a woman is raped, she must marry her rapist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, many examples of polygamy where men have multiplied wives and concubines, and then even biblical heroes had multiple wives. So right, right. what do you do with that hot mess? And then, uh, as usual, the memes and the pictures have some... You know, pictures from back of trucks and signs and memes that are online stuff. So, yeah, we're really gonna hop over to chapter eight, and we're <clears> gonna <throat> spend most of our time in chapter nine. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> we want to get to the kind of the those specific scripture kind passages. of like prickly passages. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of like oh, okay, like this. You know, what? How do we? You know, what do we think about this? So, like Clark saying is kind of doing yeah. you know some of the work. So not just even reading it, but then like and then digesting it and like, okay, what's going on here? And so he says that at the beginning of chapter eight, when he says like, you know, he goes back to, you can't just read a Bible verse if we want to understand like contextually what's actually going on in the big picture. Mm-hmm. Like you can see what's going on in these couple verses, but then what is it in the theme of the Bible that God's doing with women, with, with humanity, with men, with women. And so I love that he breaks down um, a couple words here. And so he breaks down the word helper on page 112. And he, Dan is going back to the very beginning um, where, you know, Genesis chapter one and two, where mm-hmm. sin had not yet entered and we're defining, you know, who's there and what their relationship is like. And what's their purpose. And yeah. what is their purpose? Yeah. Yes. And so he... Um, he breaks that down at the end of 112. God's original design is for men and women to co-rule and co-reign in community with one another to advance God's purposes on earth. And he breaks down the word. What is this word you were saying? It, is in, there. Is yeah, on the top there. of, yeah, like 113. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And so like one of the things that people uh, will mention from Genesis um, is how God created Adam and God created Eve. And so we kind of know the story, you know, Adam from the dust and then Eve from Adam's side, Adam's rib. Yep. And the word there, the is there word literally means, Dan talks about it means side, right? What? Yeah. Oh, am I looking at the wrong one? Oh, sorry. No, it means Hel- helper. helper. You're good. <laughs> yes. You're good. <laughs> and why, you know, some folks, even in today's day and age, mm-hmm. we see the word helper and we think like, oh, yeah, because, you D- know. Diminished role. Eve's inferior. Less That's than. why. You know, because if yeah. you're a helper, you're not, you know, the superhero. If you're if you're the helper, you're Batman. You're not Robin. And Flip that oh around. My- you're you guys, <laughs> you're Alfred the Butler, not Batman or Robin, or you're Robin, not Batman. Yes, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, when you, people say helper, you're thinking, yeah, you don't have as an important mm-hmm. of role, mm-hmm. or you're not as gifted or skilled, or you're less than. But that's not what Yahweh means. Like when we look at what, yeah, when going. we look at what the word actually means and where it's used throughout other places in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Dan tells us this that nearly every time it appears, it's referring to God Himself. Yeah. And so. I mean, picture that. So he references Psalm 33, verse 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help, and our same shield. word, yeah. and our shield. So help right there in that verse is the same word used in Genesis to describe Eve. Mm-hmm. And so helper is not this derogatory term that's meant to be inferior. It's actually yeah. something that's revered and honored that God uses to describe himself. For sure. And when you look back <laughs> at all those stories, who actually is like the the superhero and the savior of the story? 
it's God. Yeah. It's not Israel. Because <laughs> yeah. Israel's always doing dumb things, getting themselves in trouble. Yes. And God's the one swooping and going, I'm staying loyal to my covenant, to mm-hmm. my word, and I'm going to redeem you again and again and yes. again. Yes. So that's, that's an important distinction. And right below that, too, he talks about a little bit more of the breakdown with the word side. Yes. And that's a picture of man and woman side by side, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is why you know, that word was used. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So pretty cool. I like on page 114, as you keep flipping through, he does look at the the ramifications of what happens in Genesis 3. Mm. Because in Genesis 1 and 2, you have God's intention, you have God's heart, you have God's design, you have the purpose for humanity, like you just said, co-rule, co-reign, co-steward, mm. everything God gave together. Um, but sin not only alters our relationship with God, because that's why Jesus Christ had to come, but it really radically affected how we relate to one another. Yeah. Um, just look on the news and you see humanity. We don't get along. I mean, look at the news. Look in your house. Yeah, look in your house and <laughs> your parents' house, your friend's sure, house. And, yeah. and, and we, ha- we have a hard time. And so from Genesis 3 on is where it really goes downhill and it's because of sin. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's actually the next chapter, Genesis 4, you have the first instance of polygamy. Yeah. And... And we'll talk about that a little more later, but not once does God ever bless that or encourage it or command it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right, for for the well-being of the relationship. Yeah. Even We'll get to it again in a little bit, but even when Jesus gets at the heart of what relationships are supposed to look like, specific, specifically between man and woman um, and intimacy, he mm-hmm. points back to Genesis 1 and 2. Yeah. Because that's what he, he designed it to The, the beginning to be. of the so, beginning. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun after this because he starts going through all these different ladies and examples of the Bible. Yes, and okay. there's many. Well, you know, you might not; these might not be names that pop up, mm-hmm. you know, in your normal like Bible reading or Bible study. And so I was glad that he was naming these, and and he's naming these with the purpose of of giving you examples of how this is not God's intention. Just like when we talked about with slavery, um, how it was God meeting His people in the midst of their own mess. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing here. So God is constantly, you know, progressing and evolving the placement of women in their culture at the time, um, because that was not his intent, like we saw in Genesis 1. Yeah, that they would be stepped on and squashed. Yes, exactly. Yep. And so, I mean, we talked about, we know Miriam, that might be one that you've heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, Deborah, mm-hmm. she was a warrior, a judge, a <laughs> prophet, like a military leader. She's like Wonder Woman of the Bible. Yeah. I know. She's got her shield and her lasso of truth coming for you. Um, Holda. Yeah, yeah. Holda, another female prophet, mm-hmm. speaking, teaching, encouraging. Mm-hmm. You have mm-hmm. Proverbs 31, you have Joel's prophecy, and then he just kind of keeps flipping through. And there's so many other examples of people um, that God used for his glory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he kind of moves in through a, a time here where we look at specifically at women in the time of Jesus and how they were treated. Hmm. Right. And then I appreciate, again, his cool images on 120. It talks about like the redemptive trajectory of Jesus. Mm-hmm, like what's mm-hmm. he working towards? Well, he's working towards Genesis 1 and 2 again, the new Eden, the new heavens, right, the new Right, but working earth. backwards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so you keep reading, like you said, and then Paul's examples too of like mm-hmm. when you get to the time of the early church, like with Phoebe and Priscilla. Um Yeah, and so he kind of talks at the end here about, so I mean, where are you at, Clark? I'm on page 122. I don't have to be oh. there, though. If you want to keep going forward or backwards, we can. Um, well, I'm, I'm just up to, you know, 127-ish. I'm kind of oh, getting to the end. Girl. Well, because I just feel like the, the, meat, the, the meat of where we uh-huh. want to spend time is um, is in chapter 9. Yeah, so definitely. So, okay, there. how about this? At this point, what's a major takeaway from you for you from reading chapters, you know, 7 and 8? Sure. So a main takeaway for me and something that I have loved just in these two chapters is that it, from the very beginning after, after the fall. So from the very beginning, it's, you know, God in harmony with people and people in harmony with each other. Mm -hmm. But then after that, it's culture that is, and society and just evil and sin in the world that is, you know, um, silencing and opposing and oppressing. And so you see this narrative Uh, throughout the entire biblical story now, like when you look at it with this lens, like, oh, wow, it really wasn't like that at the Mm -hmm. beginning. And so what I love about it is to see like our, our hero, you know, God constantly pulling women to the, you know, to the front saying, no, like these, these women are important and valued. And so 
I think just realizing that narrative actually exists, like yeah. for me, Bobby, you know, an X X chromosome, like a woman, that's huge to see like, no, it's not just, you know, God when he decided yeah. it was God for Ever. all time. Yeah. Yes. And so that was encouraging. It, just flushing that out a little bit more saying like, no, like, you know, this is, this is what the evil one is doing unto us. Like the brokenness and the harm that we mm-hmm. see, this is not God's original design. Yeah. And then honestly, like specific stories really encourage me too, because if you, you know, if, if God really does desire this for women, and if he really does, well, then there would be real life examples. And guess what? There is. Yeah. <laughs> and God. so the Bible, even that they're written down in the Bible, like the Bible, it's a male dominated society. But Dan says that in, in here somewhere. Yeah. And so even that we have written record of these, you know, prophets and leaders and mm-hmm. um it's, it's amazing. Some of my favorite ones are actually from the New Testament, and I'm so encouraged. And they're all about how God entrusts his message mm. with women. Yeah. Because if there's one thing that is like so important unto the Lord in us partnering with him, it's telling more people about him. Yeah. And so break <laughs> it down. Like, what, what do you mean by God's entrusted that? Because he's entrusted to everybody yes. for us in 2021. But like, what biblically are you getting at there? Totally. So if you go back, um, so I, my examples will focus on in the New Testament. So if you look at and Dan brings them up. If you look at the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, Mm -hmm. she encounters Jesus and Jesus is actually telling her he's the Messiah in John, this is John four. Um, and she is potentially one of the first people to even know that from Jesus own mouth. First Messiah. And also the first, she's like the first, yeah, she's the first one to know he's the Messiah and she might be the first Gentile convert. Ever. Yes. And so, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because he tells her this, you know, at the well, nobody's around, nobody. And, and Fatima, that's her name. She. That's the name in the chosen, not biblically. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I'm thinking of the chosen right now because yeah. it's such a fun uh, imagery. Ep- yeah. Episode eight, season one, we recommend if you haven't <laughs> seen it. Anyway, she runs back to town and she tells everybody and, and, you know, everybody knows who this person is because Jesus has entrusted her with that. Yeah. And the same thing is with, um, you know, even Dan talks about this as well, but even women coming to Jesus tomb after he resurrected, that's like the most pivotal, like groundbreaking thing yeah. in history. And still to date that has ever Easter. happened yeah. in history. So is, you could say the first evangelists <laughs> were women. Yeah. <laughs> and so yep. I, I take those messages to heart because I feel like, you know, we read these things and we can understand them with our brain and we let them seep into our heart, but then really to see and watch things play out in this story with these women and their names and, um, and really the importance that has been laid on them by God himself. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like encouraged me. You were talking about old Testament examples. Yeah. One that my (laughs) eyes have been reopened to recently was that in the life of Moses. So Moses, we look at him right. as a hero of the Bible, and he, he did a lot of good, and God used him for his glory, but mm-hmm. Moses also made tons of bad decisions, and mm-hmm. also was at the mercy of other people in God's grace. And so even his very birth, uh, if it wasn't for his, his mom <laughs> and, and the midwives uh, of, mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. the story that kept him alive. Right, they disobeyed. There are yeah. two midwives that disobeyed Pharaoh's edict. Well, even his mom too. Yep, and said, mm-hmm. we're going we're gonna to do what's right. Mm-hmm. So there you go, Moses' life saved. And then you have Miriam, his sister, mm-hmm. who is the one working the Nile River and getting him <laughs> to Pharaoh's daughter and then uh, talking to Pharaoh's daughter and getting Moses back to his mom for a while <laughs> yes. so that she could wean him and grow him up to, till he could go then back to Pharaoh's daughter and live in the palace. It totally. Fast forward, even even after Moses is is leading God's people mm-hmm. in Exodus four, there's a bizarre story where God, where Moses ignored God's instruction and did not follow the <laughs> circumcision law of the time. It's right. crazy, and God is so mad at him. It says that He's going to strike him dead. Mm-hmm. God's going to take Moses out because Moses is being disobedient. Right. Think about that for a moment. You're like, wait, what? And who saves the day? His wife Zipporah. Zipporah. She yeah. jumps out and circumcises her son. Flint knife. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> Holy cows, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider moment here. What's going right. on? She's, yeah, saves the day. And then God relents and he pulls yeah. back from from the situation. So you have <laughs> midwives, you have Miriam, you have his mom too. Mm-hmm. And then you have Zipporah just right there. And there's other examples, but you're just like, mm. man. So I guess I'm encouraged when I look at <laughs> Emmanuel, speaking for our church, can't speak for all churches. I'm just grateful for the ladies and how I meet Christ in them in the many different ways we have. Yeah. So we just had Mother's Day. 
Yeah, yeah. Jody Grass and, and April Hurst, you know, mm-hmm. share their heart, and that was powerful. Yeah. They said things that were so profound of the Lord and things that were more helpful coming from them and as if they came from me. It's like, thank mm-hmm. you for, for sharing your heart. Yeah. You go through the whole staff. You've got um, Bailey Talsma. You've yeah. got... Uh, Kathy Lewis. Kathy Lewis and J- Jessica Higgins mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. helping the youth and the children mm-hmm. and pointing them towards Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to worship, you've got... Oh, man. Nyasia, Nyasia Kyla, Ray, Rachel, yeah. um, Vicky Dove. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm missing, so forgive me for listening to this and I forget you, but... That's incredible. Yeah. Um, you, you just go through and then there's this. I mean, so many Carrie people Garcia, behind the scenes. The yeah, Linda Hill, Ruth Simquitz. It's yes. just like, holy smokers, you guys. What a wonderful partnership we yeah. hear with men and women, both unto the Lord for for the glory of God in the body, of through mm-hmm. the body of Christ. So it's, yeah. you know, we're living these times too. Yeah. So should we dive into kind of like the guts of this now? Not chapter nine. The guts, you the guys. Guts of this it. is good. This is this good. Is this is the hard work. start the specific examples mm-hmm. of like, what are they getting at here? So let's mm-hmm. flip to 132. We've okay. talked about this a little bit before. But sure. this is talking about if a woman is raped, does she have to marry her rapist? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and sell and eventually slavery and selling of women. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This law was given to protect women. Because sure. naturally what happened if a man raped a woman, he, he got what he wanted, which is evil and vile, and then he would leave. Mm-hmm. And so then God instituted laws that forced the woman to be taken care of legally. Yeah. Financially. Uh, physically protected, given food and clothes, because at that time it wasn't like she could just go pick up a job and provide for herself. Yeah. And so God instituted into yeah. like the, the DNA of their culture, which is so messed up. He's saying, okay, I'm going to protect and redeem these ladies here. Mm-hmm. And what's beautiful about it is it was the woman's choice. She did mm. not have to mm-hmm. marry legally, but but she also was legally given the option. Sure. One thing to really understand, like Clark said, is just like the the total, like the the gut-wrenching like evil that was happening. Like a woman was nothing like yeah. at this time. And so like you said, like now, okay, like maybe I can work at McDonald's for, you know, six months or eight months to try and get on my feet. Like, no, nope, that's not happening. Like the yeah. one thing that you had was to give yourself to a man. And if a man took that from you, you had nothing. Mm-hmm. And so we saw this play out actually in the family line of David with his yeah. son-in-law, or excuse me, with his stepson and stepdaughter. Yeah. And she says, please marry me. Yeah, or I have nothing. To I it. have nothing. Yeah. And a- so... Yeah, Tamar and Amnon. None. Yes. Yeah. And so Absalom, you know, comes, it's, it's awful. It's just such yeah, an evil, terrible. sad story, but that like helping us on, you know, 2021 understand like, Oh, what do you mean? She didn't have, what do you mean? She could like, well, what we mm-hmm. mean is that it was such a male dominated society, yeah. like that there were no options. Yeah. And then there are times too, like in Deuteronomy 22, mm-hmm. it talks about that. If, if a man, um, out of, but if out in the country a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married, so she is like mm. engaged, and he rapes her, he's to be put to death. Oh, okay. Oh, right. On yes, page one thirty-three. Mm-hmm. So again, um, there's violence in the Old Testament. We're gonna hit that later on. But here, but that just shows you again, like the intensity of God's right. desire to protect women. Going, you don't yes. touch her, mm-hmm. and if you do, then you need to provide for her and protect her and take care of her. Yeah. And so. Page 134, it, it talks about um, how it was the woman's legal right there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you flip over to 135. If, is it okay if we go there? Yeah, go. You start talking about you know polygamy and what happens there. Is it biblical <laughs> marriage to marry many wives? Uh, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. It is not. Is it in the Bible? Yes. Is it God's sure. desire, intention, and hope and purpose when you go back to Genesis 1 and 2? Never. Mm-hmm, no, mm-hmm, that's not mm-hmm. it. And so when Jesus was asked about marriage... He goes back to the beginning, God's mm-hmm. intent, his purpose, mm. all that. It's in Genesis 4, you see the first um, polygamy kind of occur. Right. And it's a train wreck. Never once, never once in the Bible does polygamy go well. Not even for yeah. the godly leaders. It never goes well for anybody. No. Women aren't happy. The The leader is not happy. The man's not happy. It, it goes bad. And usually the kingdom of God nosedives, the Israel, mm. because of these relationships. Yeah. And it's just mm-hmm. got to break God's heart. And so I think biblically there's an important um, note to make here, and that is anytime any kind mm-hmm. of sexual, I will call it perversion, comes from uh, moving away from God's design, be it mm-hmm. polygamy, mm-hmm. be it same-sex marriage, mm-hmm. be it uh, divorce, Jesus mm-hmm. always says it's man and woman, and he goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. 
right there. Like yeah. It's actually very clear. Hmm. Um, and so relationships are hard. Um, there's sin here, and it makes fallen living in a fallen world really difficult. But to say the Bible is not clear about these issues is actually not true, nor is it helpful. Mm-hmm. So, mm. you know, that's why if you look on page 136, that big title right there at the top says, Jesus always takes us back to the original marriage mm-hmm. design. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's helpful. So you have that there. Um, now, flip into 138 on. There yeah. are First Corinthians. We just read this as a church not long ago. Yeah. There's a passage in there that says women need to be quiet. They need to be silent, Mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. talk. And Mm -hmm. if they have questions, then they need to go home and talk to their husband. (laughs) Yeah. Ooh. (laughs) This is good, you guys. So let's learn. Let's learn together. What? Yeah. What do we get from that? (laughs) Um, So Paul, Dan, actually, Dan breaks this down. So he's referencing, you know, right away, the Corinthians passage we're going to talk about. He's referencing Timothy also here. And really one of the things that I really percolated with me when Dan was breaking it down is um, kind of what he had said before. So let's not just take a verse and, you know, stand alone. Whoop. Let's take the verse, read it in the sentence or in the paragraph in the chapter in all of the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so we can understand this a little bit better in that. But more than that, even when you look at what's happening, even in the chapters, like Paul it was saying something a little bit different, even a couple chapters before this. Yeah. And so before this, Paul was talking about how, you know, women were praying and prophesying. So we know that even just in those two differences, it's like, oh, okay, hmm, like he must not mean for them just to be like yeah. duct tape on their mouth, sitting in the back quietly. Yeah. And so also <laughs> yeah. to add to that, though, yeah, in First Corinthians 11, when he's talking about how women are praying and prophesying, mm-hmm. it's within the context of worship and the yeah. community. Mm. So it's not like they're at home in their closet their praying thing. and prophesying. Yes. It's like, no, these are leaders in the church mm-hmm. speaking. Mm-hmm. So like you just said, clearly this is this is doable mm-hmm. and, and there's a place for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just what's appropriate. So then where does that leave us then for what's he getting at? Why does he say, be quiet, keep your mouth shut if you have a question? Well, that's why it's so fun to dig in with this, you guys. So, it, you know, this is the very beginning of the church, like, Ew. talk about, you know, tough conversations, awkward, you know, this is, these are people that are, you know, even now we live in this, but at least now we've had a few thousand years of practice. Like mm-hmm. this is like, okay, what's happening? This is brand new. And so I like how Dan talks about how um, Paul would know who he's talking to. Yeah. He knows these people by name. He Been knows there. what's going yeah. on. He knows previous issues that have happened, you know, and Dan says like, some were getting drunk on the wine used for the Lord's supper. So Paul knows these people. Yeah, Quanto's here. a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, remembering that this was brand new, that all of these churches, like there wasn't a New Testament for them to refer to. Like I love that Dan says that, or that Dan says it's just it's just playing out in real time. And so these are letters yeah. to the church and Paul is knowing these people. And so he knows that some of them, you know, were women coming from this temple of what is it? Artemis? Yeah, Artemis. Yeah, that one's for Ephesus. For okay. First Timothy. Yes. Yeah. What? No, definitely. I, I, yeah, I think I'm looking at the options, like what's going on here. And on 143, mm-hmm, 144, mm-hmm. 145, like he kind of lays out like what could be like the backstory there, do we think? I just appreciate his two options there as well. Yes. Looking at like, so what is happening then? Why would he say that? Well, one would be 143. It's a common custom mm-hmm. for, oh, sure. for like mm-hmm. when the rabbi's teaching, everyone needs to be silent. Mm-hmm. And I have all these new converts coming in, like you just said. And yeah. maybe they're breaking up worship service. Maybe they're interrupting. Maybe they're raising their hand, asking a question. I yeah. don't know. Mm-hmm. And and maybe there was one gal who was just a huge thorn in his side. I was interrupting the lesson and the sermon and the talk every week. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so if you push pause, even like with what you're saying right now, and you think about a Sunday morning and you think about how, you know, maybe there's dozens, maybe there's hundreds of mm-hmm. people gathering to try to hear this amazing message about Messiah that has yeah. come. And you think about, you know, someone jumping in, for instance, right now today during a sermon and yeah. you would be like, uh, uh, Hey, excuse me, Pastor Clark, uh, stop right there. <laughs> what, what are you getting at? And and so it's that like, oh yeah, that does make sense that yet yeah, we need to, you know, mm-hmm. be, we need to be mindful of this yeah. during worship, <laughs> especially then, if I've never been to church before and I don't know what in the world's going on. <laughs> for sure. So that was a common custom. And then the other thing was uh, separate seating. That was the yeah. second option where you actually did have men and women sit on one side mm-hmm. and the other gender on the other side. Mm-hmm. And so maybe... <laughs> 
honey, <laughs> did you put the dog out? <laughs> like hollering across the aisle to right. your husband or Not whatever. Not relevant, lady. Yeah, what's yeah. for lunch? What's for dinner? <laughs> it's like, shut up. Be quiet. We're trying to listen. Yeah. And you can't talk to your family. I don't know. So I think I was talking to Grandpa Corver, Pastor Harold, yeah. for many of you. He's 90 years old. And I was curious, like, hey, Grandpa, back in the day, like, let's go back to the 60s when you were preaching and teaching mm-hmm. on this stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like, how did you make sense of this? And he's mm-hmm. like, obviously, it was just, uh, I love you, it was just a matter of fact. He said, obviously, it was just a specific situation in Corinth that sure. Paul had to address. Mm-hmm. He's like, it's a no-brainer. He's like, because <laughs> women are teaching and you, God's using them in all these other spots. And he brought up 1 Corinthians 11 too. Mm-hmm. Like they're um, speaking in the church. So clearly something was just going off here. And you're like, mm. oh, okay, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> I'm glad that even back then, you know, there was someone saying this as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's a good thing to note, you guys. There's lots of opinions that we could read into and, yeah. you know come to your aid when you're trying to make an argument for something. This is one that we're talking about because we think that it's most helpful. And one thing that I really loved is at the end of 144, when Dan talks about how it's kind of, um, it's kind of a posture as well that he's trying to offer the women of the church. And so Mm -hmm. when he's saying the word quiet in this context, um, it's almost something to help them understand that like before you speak up, like we need to actually learn and and be quiet. We need to quiet ourselves. And the line that he says here at the end within within church, um, what does he say? Tradition has nearly smothered. Yes. Learning precedes teaching. Mm. And so just That's a reminder good. to folks like, hey, you know, um, we – we're learning together and to do that, we actually need to be quiet sometimes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I like that, that, that notation that he gave us too. If you haven't picked this up yet, Bobby and I are huge fans of the chosen TV show. Season two right now. Um, One of the things that we appreciate about kind of this topic is actually watching Mary Magdalene. And there's another character named Rama in the show. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they've been following Jesus for a long time now. And in it, they're trying to make sense because all the guys had been to like, Bible school, mm. Bet Midrash, and all these right. other things. But they had to memorize yeah. like the Old Testament, like when they were kids. And so yeah. they're breaking out about a song. They're singing mm. a psalm, and they're singing some prophecy from Isaiah. And the ladies are looking around, and also Matthew, the tax collector, because he bounced and jumped ship from the Jewish culture. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. like, they're outsiders. They're like, how do we, how do we make sense of this? Mm-hmm. And so it's really fun to watch how they're artistically showing, like they're learning and creating, and Jesus is making a space for them because part of his following yeah. was men and women. Now. Yeah. Can I hop over to the First Timothy passage real quick? I do. Okay, so for the First Timothy passage, it's a little different. It says very similar things. Um, what's interesting there is there's instruction. I'm trying to find it. Where is it listed? Yeah, also being told to be quiet. Timothy is in Ephesus right now, and that was where you were getting at the Temple of Artemis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's also sometimes talk about like what people should wear, and they need to be moderate and um, right. wear nice clothes, basically, and not huge earrings or whatever. Like, what's he getting at? In those cultures, there was the the gospel and the church were exploding, and there's people jumping ship from their culture and from their demon worship, their temple, into mm-hmm, following mm-hmm. Jesus. And part of it was... The Temple of Artemis was the biggest one in Ephesus, and it was a all female deities, and it was all mm-hmm. around sex. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. people were hardly wearing clothes. There was um, people having intimacy with multiple people. In case they're young years watching this or listening to it, right, just out in the open, out like that open. was their worship. Yeah, it was yeah. their worship. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so they're jumping over to, to follow Jesus <laughs> yeah, now. And so right. I mean, honestly, you have the whole everyone's welcome. Come as you are. But none of us can stay as you are. Yeah. And so, again, for First Timothy, and in the Corinthian passage, Paul is given specific instructions to a specific group of people mm-hmm. saying, like, hey, you know, put on a robe. <laughs> or, <laughs> like, don't wear the, the earrings that are dedicated to the demon Artemis or Diana. Sure. Like, take those off, please. And that's just part of them in their culture learning how to walk in Christ-likeness. Yeah, like, exactly. okay, fun. And so <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we're getting at there. Um, is there, are there any other passages or anything else that we're, we skipped over or we're supposed to mention, Bob? You know, I feel like those are the two main that we wanted to, that we really wanted to, uh, make sure to, um, yeah. get out in the open with you guys and just kind of flush out and make sure that we have understanding. Yeah. But, so yeah. we've had Old Testament examples, mm-hmm, New Testament mm-hmm. examples, God's design and his intention at creation. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the Old Testament laws about rape and slavery and like what's going on. Mm-hmm. I think I, for me, at least, 
I, I'm satisfied with some of the biblical answers that we've given, yeah. we've, been, we've discovered here. Yeah, I love how Dan ends it. And he talks about how just around the world now, like missionaries, you know, in China and other places have helped just progress like the position of women too. And then he ends those just kind of like have conversations with people. Like if this is something that, you know, we don't need to force, you know, a conversation, but if this comes up within your family or around your dinner table or something like this is confusing. And yeah. so like, if you have like the handles that Dan's given us, like that is really helpful. Mm. And like Clark said, you know, we didn't really talk about like roles right now in this chapter. Like this chapter is just, is just helping us understand mm -hmm. that like the Bible is not diminishing women. It's not, you know, it's not talking about how they're, less valuable or they're, they don't have the same worthiness. Yeah. No, like it's equal value, equal worthiness. And then there are, there is differentiation yeah. to in, um, you know, in marriage, in your home, in church as well. And so just, just really grateful to journey with you guys. Thanks so mm -hmm. much for following along. Like Clark said, we're going to be back. So the next one is about science and the Bible, and it's going to be a blessing to Jesus riding a dinosaur. Like what is oh, that? Yeah. Part four. So tune <laughs> in uh, next week. That's where we'll be going. Have an awesome next seven days. God bless you guys. See ya. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Have a great day.